Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, this is the first session of the uh, evaluating of the OpenStack. Uh, we have a session uh, every day, uh, two or three, uh, two or three sessions of the track. So today we'll start uh, with uh, future of the OpenStack distribution. Uh, luckily, there will be uh, two sessions today. There will be three sessions tomorrow, the same place at two o'clock. And then every other day will be morning sessions on the Wednesday and Thursday. They're all under one track evaluating OpenStack. So all of them are related to uh, help you to make decision of, uh, on the OpenStack distribution, uh, what features of OpenStack, uh, and what are the things to look in the OpenStack. So uh, without further ado, the first talk will be on the future of OpenStack distribution uh, by uh, Mark Smith and uh, Pete Chadwick. Thanks, Arkady. Thank you very much, Arkady. Um, <clears throat> a pleasure to be able to talk to you about the future of OpenStack distributions. My name is Mark Smith. Uh, I'm a product marketing manager for SUSE OpenStack Cloud. Uh, Pete is the director of product management, which is why he's wearing the shirt and I'm wearing the, uh, the casual clothing. <laughs> I'd like to start just talking a little bit about our, um, the importance of choosing and making decisions, right? So, a uh, quote from a movie, you must choose, but you must choose wisely. So we're all faced with choices. And one of the, the things that we appreciate about OpenStack is that the choice of consumption method is within our control. But I also like this quote from uh, Peter Drucker, who's a business analyst and, a, and an author. He said this, whenever you see a successful business, someone once made a courageous decision. Uh, now, I quite like that. We're in Boston, historically. I'm talking to you as a person from Britain, right? In Boston, uh, the right to make courageous decisions is baked into the history, and uh, the right to make courageous decisions is baked into the history. So if you're an OpenStack user, you've already made your first courageous decision. Or maybe you're just looking at it and evaluating things right now. But you've chosen OpenStack, you have more choices that are on the way. So let's just start by talking about consumption models. And now the user survey this year from April 2017 has a couple of comments from users that re-emphasize the fact that they appreciate choices within their control. They can choose how they consume uh, OpenStack. Uh, that's, that's really important. Now, uh, before we, we talk about the individual choices, we're here talking to you from uh, the OpenStack perspective. Uh, as SUSE, we don't have an axe to grind on which option you choose. Now, the reason for that is that we power a lot of managed cloud offerings. We obviously have a, an OpenStack distribution, and that's the theme for this particular discussion. But we also want users to be doing it yourself, building your own. Now, that's really important because um, education, getting familiar with using OpenStack is absolutely critical. And a lot of customers that start by testing from a do-it-yourself perspective uh, end up moving to a different consumption model as they uh, mature in their requirements and as they make further choices. So what are the choices? Well, a do-it-yourself approach, a build your own, uh, means that you're going to take the upstream code. Uh, you're going to decide how that works in your environment and you're going to take on the responsibility for building your cloud, managing your cloud, upgrading your cloud. And we'll go into a few more bits of detail about that. Now, of course, in a do-it-yourself, build-your-own environment, you could take the OpenStack distribution code. You just have to support it yourself. But then you'd get an install framework that kind of goes with that. Uh, with an OpenStack distribution, what you're getting is a prepackaged um, version of OpenStack with choices that have already been made for you with uh, a deployment framework that should make it a lot easier to get started and get up and running. So again, we'll talk a little bit more about an OpenStack distribution. A managed cloud is really where um, you're taking the least amount of personal input to the cloud. You're basically saying to someone else, hey, drive my cloud for me. Um, I'll pay the taxi driver, you take me from A to B, 
you're responsible for um, administering the cloud and then actually doing the work with it, but you're getting somebody else to build it for you, uh, manage it for you, <coughs> upgrade it for you, all of those things. So let's go into those in a little more detail. Let's just talk about the pros and cons of a, of a do-it-yourself approach. Now, uh, my illustration here is of a kit car, right? Um, you can buy the components for a car and you can build it yourself. If you're an enthusiast, you may well do that. Can I just check, has anybody uh, built their own car in the audience? No one prepared to make the courageous decision of building their own car. <laughs> Not unreasonable, okay? That's a lot of hard work. Maybe you don't like spending your weekends with your, uh, up to your elbows in oil and, and, and piece parts for mechanics. Some of us do, uh, and of course, in the, in the OpenStack world, many of us decide that we're gonna do that. Now, just to put that into context, um, a colleague of mine, many distributions ago, calculated that there were 1,400 components that you had to configure to build a do-it-yourself OpenStack cloud platform. It's probably gone up a lot since then. Uh, the user survey for this year, from April 2017, um, shows that of the people that responded to that survey, three quarters of them with <coughs> OpenStack clouds are using between six and 11 of the OpenStack projects, between six and 11. Now that's a lot of componentry to build, deploy, maintain and look after. But here's the pros of doing that. OpenStack is modular by nature. So, uh, you know, you have choice. That's a really uh, appreciated and valued by OpenStack users. You can install what you need. You can save a lot of cost. How can you save cost? Well, if you're building a car and all the components are free, that's a fairly cheap car. What it doesn't take into account, of course, is your labor and your time, the value of that time, to build it, configure it, maintain it, and everything else that you need to do. But you can save a lot of cost. If you have the right skill set, you have the right in-house in uh, team of people. You also get almost unlimited flexibility and customization. So you can make OpenStack exactly what your business needs it to be. Now those are all really positive uh, pros of a, of a build-it-yourself a build approach. Just flipping the coin over very slightly, uh, back in 2015, 451 Research, uh, as an analyst commentary said, that OpenStack is consistently recognized as being overly complex to configure, deploy, and upgrade. That matches the experience of a lot of customers that, that I talk to. They, they appreciate OpenStack and all the value it adds, but many of them have had a pretty complicated time of getting it up and running. And I think that even came out in the, uh, the keynote material this morning. Um, has that changed? Well, yes, it has. OpenStack has matured. It's become easier. But again, a couple of, commentary, uh, a couple of comments from customers in the user survey. Uh, sometimes the complexity of the projects and deployment can be a major problem. So that was just from April. The biggest challenge is to upgrade the production system. Now, if you have built your own OpenStack cloud, that is a challenge because every six months the code base is going to change. You don't have to change every six months, but the longer you leave it, the harder it will become to get up to the, the latest revision. So again, that's a, that's a difficulty that we, we have to weigh in the balance of the, the courageous decision. Now, of course, if you do it yourself, you're going to have to deal with the maintenance and the upgrades even uh, of the code you're using. So um, there's a, an overhead there that you've got to factor into account. So that's the do-it-yourself approach. Um, let's change tack a little bit and talk about a distribution. Now, when I'm buying a new car, and here I probably need to say a new automobile, when I'm doing that, I normally go to a dealership and I've done my homework, I've done my evaluation, I've chosen my model, I've chosen my color, and I drive the thing out of the showroom when I paid for it, and I start doing something with it straight away. Now, I have to say that OpenStack is not like buying a new car, right? You can't simply drive it away and start, but you can make the whole process of, of deploying, 
getting up and running and starting to do some work with your OpenStack uh, much quicker and easier and slicker with an OpenStack distribution. Because the deployment frameworks here, um, SUSE uses Crowbar. Crowbar, uh, we found to be extremely useful in, in making a configurable OpenStack cloud uh, pretty easy to get up and running. Now, what else do you get with a, with a distribution? Well, uh, another of the comments in the user survey was that um, installing the high availability elements and configuring those for OpenStack was pretty manual pretty difficult to do. So an OpenStack distribution should do that for you. And it should be part of the, the framework for rolling out the whole of the cloud. If I'm buying a brand new car, I want somebody to have done some quality testing, to have made sure that it was reliable, and also to give me some warranty and some support. Well, that's what you should expect with a distribution. You're not doing it on your own. You're doing it with a partner, and they should provide you with uh, a quality tested, ready to run, uh, pre-packaged mix of features that will allow you to do what you need to do. Now, of course, doing it yourself, you can have that extra customization and adaptability. You should expect a distribution, though, to give you almost everything, if not everything, that you require. And then, of course, you get the managed, automated updates, bug fixes, and all of those things. And you should also be expecting to get non-disruptive upgrade capabilities. So when you go from one revision to another, you're looking for zero downtime. <clears throat> you're taking away the, the management overhead. That's what you should expect uh, from a distribution. So effectively, although you won't necessarily just drive it out of the showroom, you should expect to be able to deploy and configure in hours and not days or months. So, there are pros and cons here. This is going to be a little more restrictive. It's going to be uh, a little more prepackaged, but it should be making life a lot easier. Now, we're going to talk about the future of um, where the distribution is going for OpenStack in a few moments. Before we do, though, I wanted just to talk a little bit about this courageous decision for whether you go do it yourself, managed service provider, or managed, managed um uh, offering, or whether you go for a distribution, you're going to have to think about these factors that may be unique to your organization. So first up, uh, you have the same decision to make about uh, cost, capex, opex, balance, as actually you would whether you were going for, let's say, a private cloud or a public cloud, right? Uh, you need to look at whether you want to pay for um, your OpenStack private cloud as a service, so entirely from an OPEX perspective. That might lead you to decide that you want to go for a managed offering, managed cloud offering. On the other hand, you might want to weigh up what are my capital expenditure, uh, what's that going to be if I decide to run it on my own infrastructure? Now, if you have your own infrastructure, you already have your own compute uh, resources, your own networking infrastructure, you may well want to adapt that. You might well want to take that to its next level of, of efficiency. You might have gone from physical to virtual and now need to go to an internal private cloud. You've already bought the resource, so you've spent the capex. You don't want to get rid of that. You want to reuse it. So the cost equation here as to whether you choose one consumption model over another will vary according to your business. You'll need to think about what kind of an IT uh, team do you have in your business? What skill set do you have? How much do you have? If you have uh, a well-educated, ready-to-go uh, IT team, then the do-it-yourself approach might well be the ideal one for you. If that's somewhat limited, then a distribution might be the ideal choice to fill that gap for you. So you can get on and do what you need to do with the cloud without worrying about the underlying infrastructure. Your management overhead might be something to think about as well. So in this case, if you go for a managed cloud approach, you're going to need to have a vendor management relationship. You know, you're asking them to drive it for you. You need to control the taxi driver. You need to have um, the right management overhead to deal with that situation while you get on and administer the cloud to do what you need it to do. 
You need to weigh up your support and maintenance overhead. If you do that for yourself, how will it be done? How will it be automated? Uh, what are your requirements going to, going to need? Now, just in terms of, again, context here, uh, we have, we have um, private cloud customers using OpenStack as a distribution running fairly large clouds with just two or three people because they can offload that um, support and maintenance overhead. What are your project timescales? Now, every business will work out how long they're going to take to get from A to B, from no cloud to a private cloud. And if that has to be done pretty quickly, a do-it-yourself approach might be something you don't want to consider. Uh, maybe you're going to go for a distribution or a managed cloud offering because you've got to get there really quickly. Again, that needs to be weighed up. The last item about customization, um, if you're an organization that has specific requirements, then a do-it-yourself approach might be the ideal thing to use. And of course, your influence in the upstream community might also be um, uh, more important to you, and therefore the do-it-yourself approach might work well there. So these are factors that you would need to think about, consider, balance um, in making your decision. Now, we're going to take a little bit of time now just to talk specifically about um, OpenStack distributions uh, and that particular choice element. So let me hand over, please, to uh, Pete Chadwick. He'll talk us through, first of all, the history of the OpenStack distribution and then through the rest of that criteria. Thanks, Mark. Um, so I actually um, have, my first OpenStack Summit was here in Boston when it was, uh, uh, for, it was the Essex Design Summit. Um, I don't know if anybody else was here at that point. <laughs> I was making a joke earlier talking to somebody, the session was at a hotel over by the, by the seaport, and I think there were five meeting rooms, and the uh, OpenStack party after the summit was in the bar downstairs at the hotel. Um, not a lot of people involved. Um, so it was pretty exciting times. Um, we launched our first, uh, SUSE launched the first enterprise distribution based upon Essex, and fairly quickly after that, there were a number of other providers. Um, Red Hat, uh, I think there were some Piston Cloud, you know, Nebula, that launched distributions about then. Um, and since then, you've seen you know, a lot of releases. Uh, there have been some enhancements that adopting um, a distribution model as opposed to a do-it-yourself model, as, as Mark explained, have made things easier. So for example, um, automating deployment of, of a, high availability, a highly available control plane. It's actually a fairly complex task to configure and, and set up um, on a DIY basis um, because the distributions make certain assumptions about how you're going to configure um, the environment, what packages you're going to use, it, it, it makes that a little bit easier. Um, you know, following on from that, for example, um, fairly straightforward uh, step to add high availability for compute nodes. Um, you're now starting to see non-disruptive upgrades. Um, again, because the distribution makes a certain set of choices on how things are going to be set up, how things are going to be configured, it simplifies the process to do the, to do the upgrade. Now, one thing I'll do is I'll put in, um, uh, put in a plug for uh, the product working group. Um, Arkady is, is on the product working group, as am I. Um, and one of the things we did, uh, I think, a year ago was actually write a pamphlet specifically going into more details about the pluses and minuses of distributions versus do-it-yourself versus uh, managed private clouds. So I'd urge you to look through that. It goes into much more detail on what some of the trade-offs are. But the point is, you know, this is, this is the plug. I'm, you know, we're in the business of doing distributions. You're, you're not on your own. You've got a partner that is helping you to be successful in, in delivering what you really need, which is a functional cloud. Um, and it's typically, you know, consists of packages that the vendor has considered stable. Um, so they do some additional level of, of testing and analysis to make sure that some of the projects which maybe aren't quite ready for upstream are flagged as such, um, as tech previews or whatever. And then you've got back-end support and services. So if there's a security bug, um, it, gets, it gets pulled into the distribution uh, pretty much automatically and pushed out to you as opposed to you having to track the CVEs and, and figure out what, what's next. And then one of the important things is 
we think it can pay for itself. And this is not just us, this is 451 um, Group did some research a while ago, and, and I'd, I'd also recommend that you, that you look up this report uh, that is available. I'm pretty sure it's available on the OpenStack uh, website. Um, but it talks about the trade-offs and more quantified levels, and it makes some assumptions about the size of the cloud and what you're doing. Um, and they clearly show that if you use a distribution, you can have less staff. So depending upon the size of the cloud, you need fewer people. Mark mentioned we know, we know customers running OpenStack with two or three people. Um, I, know, I know customers that are running OpenStack with 10 times that number or 20 times that number um, because they're doing much more, uh, much more customization and much more configuration. So again, 451 says they believe that ultimately uh, an OpenStack distribution should drive lower to total cost of ownership, not only in quicker time to get something up and running, but on an ongoing basis, monitoring and managing uh, the environment. Now, one of the things that I think, you know, I mentioned a couple people um, who had distributions back in the Essex timeframe that are no longer here, and I think there's been some, some buzz about there are fewer distributions than there, than there were. And I think that's, that's kind of a natural consolidation as markets start to mature. But what, it's, what we've really seen is that um, there are still people that are using distributions, they're just partnering up, um, uh, working more closely with one another to make sure that you're delivering a more consistent solution that, that meets, meets customer requirements. We certainly think that the distribution business uh, continues, to be, continues to be a healthy one and, and one we continue to, uh, to invest in. So now this is the, the, the higher level plug for OpenStack and, and, and at, at some level it's another reason to think about looking at this from a, from a, a package point of view. And that is we see that, that OpenStack is becoming almost an integration platform in and of itself. So we have customers that are looking at it traditionally for running virtual machines, but now they're trying to say, hey, I've got bare metal workloads, HPC workloads or specific database workloads that require bare metal servers. I can, I can pull those in and manage those in OpenStack. Um, we've had a number of customers that have already specifically deployed OpenStack just to take advantage of Magnum to deliver Kubernetes as a service because they want to run containerized workloads and feel this is the quickest way for them to get up and running. But then underneath of it, OpenStack provides all this flexibility for the software-defined infrastructure. So you have a variety of hypervisors you can use. All of the software-defined networking players are providing plugins to, to work into OpenStack, which Again, lots of flexibility, but much more complexity. Uh, so again, one of the things that I think distribution providers try to do is provide a common framework so that you can make sure that all these things work together so that you can drive the kinds of workloads that you need when you need them. And so we think this is really where OpenStack goes ultimately. It is, it is the future for so the software-defined infrastructure. It provides the layer of APIs. It provides the, the driver framework. Uh, necessary to integrate all of these technologies, not dissimilar to what Linux has historically done. I mean, Linux provides a set of APIs upon which you can uh, write applications, derive workloads, um, and then abstract away the hardware layer underneath of it. To some extent, OpenStack abstracts um, the software-defined infrastructure to make it easier to take advantage of that for whatever workloads that you want to run. So. That's kind of the quick overview of sort of where we see distributions going, give you a little bit of flavor of what we think the trade-offs are between using a distribution versus doing it yourself versus using a managed, a managed hoster. Um, as I urge you again to follow up, there's some documentation available that goes into this in much more detail. But let me stop here and any questions, comments, challenges? Good question. Yeah, if you could do the microphone, that'd be great. So what we found is um, a choice of a Linux distro, or it, it seems to be very tightly aligned with a client's OpenStack distro. Mm -hmm. So, but there are instances and cases where clients want, you know, a different Linux distro with a different OpenStack distro. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges and opportunities there if, if there's work being done in that area? Sure. So I think everybody heard that, but it was a question of is there, you know, what's the trade-off or what's the tie-in between a Linux distribution and the, and the OpenStack that runs on top of it? Partly as and Mark talked about this earlier, that, that you a lot of, there's a lot of choices you have to make. So for example, OpenStack 
you know, when we first started working, it consisted of five projects, but I still needed a message queue, I still needed a hypervisor, I still needed a database to drive all that. And so to some extent, you, you have to pick a lot of things besides OpenStack to make everything work. Um, and as a, as a Linux distribution provider, we had a set of packages to do those things. So for example, we use RabbitMQ. We could have used something else, but RabbitMQ was the thing that made, that made the most sense for us. So to some extent, you know, you don't get to choose. Um, and, and so when you, when you buy a, an OpenStack distribution from somebody who's packaging up to work with their version of Linux, they're gonna make some choices for you. And it makes it a little bit less portable. Um, to some extent, the customers that we have almost, it, it almost doesn't matter so much because to some extent they're looking at it, well, okay, once I deploy this, it's a black box, I'm running, running workloads over here, it's virtualized and um, enterprise, most enterprise distributions will support any kind of virtual machine that you want running on top of those. And so that's where we see the, that's where we see the, the heterogeneous support um, come in. Um, but it's also a case of if we go back to one of the things you're paying for is support, the way any support or any, any company making support, offering support to customers makes it easier is they limit the choices. So there are fewer things to test, there's fewer things to break, it's just easier to, you know, if you, if you just said, if you, if you went back to the kit car that, that Mark showed, you know, how do you, how do you offer a warranty on somebody who's built their own kit car? So that's the trade-off. Does that, does that help? No. Thanks. Okay, if there's no other questions, we can, we can hang out here for a couple minutes to follow up. Otherwise, I'd urge you to look at the rest of the uh, sessions in this, in this track to talk about how do, you make, uh, how do you make a decision on how to move forward with OpenStack. And thank you.